now I'm going to test if we're live because I'm never really sure. So I'm going to go to my profile and I'm going to scroll down and I won't believe it until I see our faces moving. And um, give me one more second. This is always so exciting for me. I feel like I'm walking to the kitchen and I'm opening up the refrigerator and I really want to make sure that the uh, light turns on. So we did it. The light is on. The refrigerator door is open. Thank you so much for being here, Jake. This is very exciting. Uh, I, I, I'm so glad we're doing part two of this because we really covered some great ground before. We did. And there were a lot of questions before. And there was it wasn't uncertainty, but it was just the there was the unknowns there. Well, there was the knowns. Right. And then there yeah. was the unknowns. And uh, at that time, there were a lot of uh, unknown unknowns, right? Yeah. And uh, and here we are, and uh, very quickly, just two weeks later, we're seeing uh, we're seeing the unknown unknowns be the uh, known. So this is really exciting for me, and uh, this is going to be as informative for me uh, as I hope it is for everybody else, because you're such an authority. And uh, thank you so much for taking your time. This is great. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Again, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Jake Novak, um, I'm a 25-year political economic analyst journalist with a special expertise in the Middle East, both politically and economically and even culturally. And, you know, the last time we spoke, we left off talking about the UAE peace deal. Now, that was before Bahrain piggybacked onto that deal as well. So that was one big development. And another thing people were talking about, almost like a pipe dream, was would Donald Trump be nominated by somebody or anybody for a, a Nobel Peace Prize for his administration's role in brokering these deals? And it didn't really seem that likely to me for a number of reasons, One, of the, not the least of which being that the Nobel Peace Prize often goes to people who are posturing and making statements but don't really have tangible uh, results. And this is extremely tangible uh, for a lot of reasons, not because Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain were in shooting wars together, but more importantly, there was a state of a state of war, a state of non-recognition. You know, basically, this is building bridges. These are the kinds of things that can avoid violence and avoid uh, coldness in the future. So that was a very big deal. So since then, uh, a member of the Norwegian Parliament has nominated Donald Trump for the Nobel Peace Prize not only for this UAE, Bahrain, Israel stuff, but also for the Kosovo, Ser Serbia normalization and recognition. So this might actually happen. Uh, listen, if you were being a fair arbiter of what the Nobel Peace Prize should be, and we all know that certain people like, you know, the Mahatma Gandhi never got the Nobel Peace Prize, which is a joke. But if you were being a fair arbiter, fair arbiter of this prize, it would be very hard to make the argument, at least for this year, that Donald Trump didn't deserve it just for getting these deals done. Not because it's such a mountain that's been crossed, but because these kinds of things are tangible. These kinds of things make bigger things happen, and someone's got to get started with that. So that was a very big development just since we last talked, since our first Israel Middle Eastern uh, Periscope that we did. Yeah, and that's wonderful. And I think where we last, last uh, left off, because I'd like there to be continuity, because there were so many questions. And I think at that time, you broke news. And then right after this, you said, Adam, I just want you to know I broke this news. And then three days later, I saw it all over. So I'm very interested uh, in that news, if you could kind of repeat it, now that it's old news, but it's your old news. And then I would love to understand as well, you were discussing kind of all the business implications, that this is not just an... Uh, an issue of diplomacy, uh, but this is something that all of us can kind of touch and feel and understand deeply uh, what it means uh, for peace, right? Because peace is important to all of us and it's so important. Yeah. But also in terms of like what happens now with world trade, you know, with commerce and uh, both with, you know, developing the technology sector within Israel, which I know is really significant, but also there's so much intellectual capital in Saudi Arabia and in Bahrain, um, and uh, I'd love you to be able to discuss that as well. So let's pick up from there. Yeah. Great. So the news that was breaking was that the UAE and Bahrain wanted to get into a partnership with Israel on a tangible level. This wasn't just going to be a statement where they say, we now recognize the right of the state of Israel. Uh, and I also mentioned that this was a very clear sign that they weren't going to let the Palestinian issue stop them from other deals. It's not like they abandoned them. I think that the, the, the message was very, very clear at the signing ceremony on Tuesday, if everyone was listening, 
The message is very, very clear from Bahrain and, U and UAE to the Palestinians. They were saying to them, we're not abandoning you. However, it's time for you to get on this little bandwagon that we're getting on. This is an opportunity bandwagon. This isn't a let's just shake hands and not shoot each other. This is an opportunity thing. And I think they made that very, very clear. So one of the news, one of the pieces of news that I broke that we were talking about was when I was talking about the Haifa port. This is one of the, this is the most important port in Israel, the city of Haifa, the ancient city. And it's a very mixed city, by the way. It is, of all the major cities of Israel, this is the one that has the most Christians, Jews, and Arabs living together. And by the way, very peaceful city and hardly ever hear of any problems in Haifa. Also a lot of Druze live, Druze, you know, the, the Druze Muslims, you know, the kind of apostate Muslims live there as well. So up until for the last couple of years, a big issue in, in Israel has been this issue where they're trying to modernize that port. There was a deal pending with China to do it, but now Dubai ports, you know, connected to the UAE is now looking like they're gonna get that deal. So that's another thing I'm talking about this their role in who's partnering with Israel. Like a lot of people were saying, well, we understand that UAE and Bahrain get some great things from Israel's technology and maybe even from their military protection, because that's certainly a part of it. They're all worried about Iran. What does Israel get out of it? Well, the answer is Israel gets to work with partners much closer to them for, I think, much better terms. And in addition to the, the, the ports, the Abu Dhabi investment company, the, 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 the official sovereign wealth, wealth office is going to open its first office ever, not just in Tel Aviv, but they've never had an office outside of the United Arab Emirates. This is their first wow. foreign office. And in all places, we learned yesterday, it's going to be in Tel Aviv. And this has a lot to do with Israeli tech. That's where we left off, where I talked about how, you know, people say, well, what's the specific Israeli tech the Arabs want? The answer is all of it. They want the financial technology. They want the with both, everyone talked a little bit about the coronavirus on Tuesday and how I think there's an understanding that Israel, even though they've had some problems with the coronavirus, that they're on the cutting edge of some of the cures and vaccines. They want some of that too. And, you know, Israel has a very open rule, regulation. regulations wise, Israel is a great place for pharma. And that has a lot to do with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, not when he was prime minister, when he was finance minister. If you, look, you know, his personal history, he kind of got exiled to the finance minister position in Israel, which is usually the worst job ever. It's usually the place where everyone fails. And even though he didn't like that job, he did two, two major important things for the whole world when he was there. First is he reformed the pension process in Israel. Israel was on its way to becoming like Greece with an unsustainable pension situation, and he reformed that. The second mm -hmm. thing he did is he cut a lot of the regulations for pharma when it, come, when it came to testing, when it came to trials when it came to just setting up offices, things like that. Again, this was kind of an, uh, Mr. didn't want to be finance minister, but he thought to himself, as long as I'm finance minister, let me throw some Hail Marys here and try to do some things that might get things going. Now, Israel already had a good tech center, but Biopharma wasn't the leader in the world, you know, close to the leader in the world that it is now. So those are just a couple of things that have just happened just since our last talk where it's clear you know, that signing ceremony was very, you know, a lot, very, you know, revealed a lot of new things that we didn't already know, but I was already talking about. They want a partnership with everything. And it's got, and I'm so pleased that it has to do with economics. I know a lot of people are, are trying to throw cold water on these agreements I'm saying, gonna, this is I'm about gonna war. Down, I'm going to slow you down just for one second. Um, sure. sure. You're so articulate within, I really appreciate, but I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to uh, appreciate it as much. So could you just slow down a tiny bit? Would You're that be absolutely right. right. I got a fast talking New Yorker problem. I'm not as bad as Ben Shapiro, but I'm pretty okay. bad. So <laughs> yes. Well, let's, so let's continue with a slowdown, right? Let's uh, Yeah, I'm gonna slow down. If it's an audio book, I'm gonna turn it to like 90 speed. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the point I wanted to make was as I was talking about a couple of weeks ago. There are, it is so important that this is an economic agreement. I know some people, some people are trying to pour cold water on these peace agreements because as they rightfully point out, there was never a shooting war between Bahrain, UAE and, UAE and Israel. I do think that Bahrain and the UAE may have sponsored some terrorism and Israel may have done some things to, you know, maybe espionage in those countries. I'm not denying that. But yeah, more important to me, than saying, hey, we're not gonna shoot at you anymore, especially when the UAE and Bahrain don't really have much of a military. It's more important for me to say that they are going to continue to partner in these open, I mean, I would, you know, the investment company opening an office in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't understand the culture of the Middle East and you don't, forget about the history, just about the culture. To open an office in Tel Aviv and that, for that to be the first foreign office of your sovereign wealth fund, 
That yeah. is such a huge deal. And it cannot be downplayed. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't, yeah. I don't yeah. listen. I'm a seasoned journalist. I don't do backflips yeah. over every little photo op. I promise yeah. you. But the people pouring cold water on this either don't know their Middle Eastern culture, don't understand how an economic deal is actually important and deal just not to shit at each other because this is where more agreements will come from. Capitalism is a fine reason to make a deal. Why not? That's that's solid. And I think people need to really remember that. And already, like I said, we were seeing the Dubai ports deal being talked about very seriously. Clearly there are going to be some there's going to be some cooperation on coronavirus vaccines and treatments, which of course is top of the news for the whole world right now. Yeah. And and also this deal with the with the investment office opening in Tel Aviv. How can you throw? How can you downplay that? You really shouldn't. Yeah, and you make a really interesting point that I didn't really appreciate because I I would never downplay anything. I understood its significance, but I understood its significance kind of superficially, right? I you know I want peace, and uh, you know I want to promote the interest of all the countries because you know the world is definitely a smaller place, no matter how much uh, we uh, we might uh, desire to at least slow down its pace so we can give it a little bit more consideration, you know, these things move fast. But uh, I really didn't understand um, it beyond kind of diplomacy, right? Mm. So I didn't understand, you make such an interesting point about that it wasn't a shooting war. And so there, and it, and it was a war that might've been occurring through proxies and surrogates. Um, so it, it's, it's not something like, you know, you see on TV a celebration of people putting down their guns. Right. Um, and you know, Look, folks, these countries couldn't even say the word Israel. They had to say Zionist entity. They wow. had to say, uh, you know, they, they had to do all these things. So that to me is a big deal. Look, I learned the hard way. I went to, you know, I'm sure they're still teaching this in foreign policy classes in college because I went to, you know, I, I, that's what I learned in college also. And they tried to beat into our heads that, well, words aren't that important. You know, so if people say they, they won't even say Israel, but they make a deal behind the scenes. That's okay. You know, I learned the hard way that isn't true. If you have real, you know, for, for lack of a better term, if you have fake news about another country, if you believe in horrible hoaxes, if you believe in myths and things like that, even if you make a deal for expediency, it, it's it's not going to work long term. So when you have Bahrain saying and 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 the foreign minister of of the UAE saying Israel, saying thank you to Prime Minister Netanyahu, talking about how all those good things are happening. Uh, um, thanking him for freezing uh, building in, in in the disputed territories in the West Bank. These are all major, major, uh, major, major things that, again, if you don't know your history or if you're just going to try to pour cold water on things, you don't realize how important that is. It, look, you, you can it, it's it's difficult because they go back home, and if the and if the, if there isn't a deal like this, someone back home is going to say, "Well, how could you do a deal with those devils?" How, you know, and you know, could be the Israelis saying that, could be the Arabs saying that, and now they can say, "Like, look." That's no, that's not what's going on here. They're trying their best. We're going to put this behind us. They're not this horrible thing that we believe for a long time. I don't think that, that has to be the thrust of the agreement, but that has to be part of it because if you continue, because for example, the Israeli Egypt peace deal had no economic component, component to it, which is why it was such a you know middling thing. And Egypt continued to teach in their schools and put in their newspapers the worst kinds of horrible yeah. myths and books about Jewish people and Israeli people. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, the U, the head, the, the the front page of the major Arab papers had "Salam Shalom Peace" on it yesterday. I mean, that doesn't look like that's going to be. That wasn't on the head. That wasn't on the front page of the Egyptian papers back in 1979. Yeah. I promise you that. I remember that very well. So this is a very big deal. Yeah, yeah, and I'm very interested, and I'm very interested in. Uh, I, it's a term I've been kind of overusing lately because I've listened to some of my old periscopes and conversations, and I call it a conceptual framework. But that's because uh, I think I'm sometimes uh, aware when I discuss, you know, finances of a conceptual framework, and the conversations have to begin there. And uh, at the same time, I'm also kind of aware of uh, of the uh, domain of my own ignorance, which uh, <laughs> then requires you. To, yeah, so then it requires you to contribute that conceptual framework to me. So, uh, and hopefully to everybody else, I'm sure. Many people are so much more informed than me, uh, and uh, but it, it it does allow me to go to kind of uh, the remedial class, which is one hundred and one. And so, um, when there was peace before, you're saying that it really didn't change kind of the educational system, which is kind of where everything starts, right? If everything has a start, 
whatever you learn in second and third grade, and we've discussed this over coffee, once, uh, once it's imprinted in you, everything mm. else is like the confirmation bias and a decision rule, and it's you know very simple, there's no complexity to it. So now uh, it changes education on both sides, is that, I mean, yeah. what is the next? Look, the, there, there, yeah, it's funny, there was, Israel had a problem for many years of naivete on the, on, on, on the part of most of its citizenry. I think that when the peace deal was signed with Egypt, they really thought this was going to be a cultural exchange, not just a cessation of war and, and tanks on the border and things like that. I think they really thought that, well, now that, for example, Israel, Israelis were allowed to go and be tourists in Egypt. And that did happen. That did happen. But, and they thought that this would be some kind of great cultural exchange. You know, there was a really good movie and it turned into a Tony winning Broadway show called The Band's Visit about an Egyptian police yeah, band yeah, yeah, yeah. visit in Israel. Those kinds of things did happen, but not a lot, not a lot, Adam. They really didn't happen enough. And I think people were really disappointed in that. And one of the big reasons why it didn't happen enough is the United States, which brokered that deal as well, didn't insist on it. The Carter administration mm -hmm. just said, you guys just signed a deal saying you won't shoot at each other and that'll be that. And that was such a missed opportunity because at the time Egypt was the most important country in the Arab world. That's not true anymore. The most important Arab country is Saudi Arabia. That's not even close anymore. But at the time Egypt still was. And that would have been a great opportunity. So you have to do that. And I think we do, the United States is similarly naive and, and naive from the people who really should know better. I, I've, I've met people from the State Department. I even tried to be a foreign service officer when I came out of college. One of the first things they tried to drill into my head during the later interview process was stop being such a jerk about uh, erasing the myths. Uh, they gave me like an exercise where they had a pretend country that was claiming horrible things about the United States. And I wrote in my, in my testing brief, hey, we need to ask you to retract that. And they almost slapped me in the face. It's like, oh, no, we never, yeah. gotcha. never asked for that. And gotcha. I can understand not wanting to get into a fight over that sometimes. But all the time, you can't stay okay. silent. You can't gotcha. stay silent when these gotcha. things are out there. Gotcha. And you've got to stand up. And in the, in the textbooks in the Palestinian territories, which we paid for for a long time until gotcha. President Trump pulled the funding, gotcha. They, gotcha. they teach the kids horrible lies about Jews and about Israel. Gotcha. So that's got to stop. We're not going to have peace until that ends. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. So, but, but going into kind of the textbooks, which is really where I'm interested. So, you know, the adults are one thing and the adults have already been imprinted. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that there's peace there and I'm sure that'll kind of uh, continue residually within those people. But I'm really interested in kind of uh, how it affects the educational system on both sides, because there is now, you know, generational I don't know if the right word is animosity and I'll leave it up to you to kind of help yeah. me better, you know, give that a vocabulary, but there hasn't been a lot of that kind of human connectivity. Right. I think that, you know, listen, you've, you've heard me criticizing the, the Arab textbooks. I, I think the, the, I, I don't want to leave out the Israeli education system, which by the way, has many problems beyond these political things there. You know, the, the Israel should have a better education system and that can be a topic for an entirely different periscope. But I think that whereas the Arab textbooks, especially in the Palestinian territories, commit a sin of commission, in other words, they put stuff in there that's hateful and, 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 and dangerous, the Israeli history, for the most part, with the exception of at the, some of the university level, I think they commit a sin of omission, which is they leave out what Arab-Israeli, obviously Israel wasn't around, Arab-Jewish relationships were like in the late 18th century, early 20, sorry, late 19th century, early 20th century. I think they leave it out, not because they, they want to erase the history, but because they're forgetting that there was a different kind of feeling in the Middle East until the 1920s and the 1930s. There was, a, it, it was a better place. Um, and, and I think that there was, a, for example, there was a lot of economic cooperation. There was always a Jewish population in Israel, always from the beginning of time, but obviously it got really small. In the 1880s, Jews from Europe start to come to what is now the land of Israel and start to build it up. And the word gets out, Adam, in the whole Arab world that, hey, the Jews are here and they're building stuff and they're giving out jobs and they're pretty good to work for. And so from 1880 until about 1929, it's a pretty nice deal between the two people. And then and that builds on the relationship that was strong in Egypt. So I think, for example, that would be great if more Israeli children learned a little bit about that. I'm not saying they don't learn about it now, yeah, but it should be yeah. more emphasized. It should be so, more emphasized that hey, there, was, there were foreign 
in, in this case, it was the Nazis. There were foreign powers that influenced our relationship to the, to the bad. They, they convinced the Egyptians to do a bunch of bad things. If we can get back away from that yoke of the, of the last 90 years of this disinformation, we can start working together again. And, and that's where I think we are. So I'm gonna skip around quite a bit because then I wanna to get to some questions because the questions are so good. And uh, as I've learned from these periscopes, they're usually better than my own questions, which is, uh, it's so pleasant for me because I get to sit back and be the student in the back row. So I really appreciate that. So uh, I'm gonna skip around and then people have questions about politics, which I think is very interesting, uh, particularly Israeli politics and how this affects certain things. But I also uh, wanna get your sense and you described it a bit in, you know, in the beginning, because you know, part of my investment thesis and kind of my system view of the world is that we are seeing a bifurcation of the world, which is never, you know, really we haven't seen that in our lifetimes, certainly since you know World War One and then World War Two, um, particularly after World War Two, uh, because everybody kind of had to uh, be on our side, no matter what, yeah. they had to be on our side, and we we reconstituted Japan. We uh, reformulated. I think we wrote their constitution, and uh, sure we've done. The, yeah, we've done the same throughout Europe, where their entire economy was dependent upon kind of a benevolence almost. Uh, and you know, it is what it is. And you know, we all want Europe to you know succeed and to flourish. Uh, but there was that kind of interweb that couldn't be extracted uh, relationship, which was great. But now we're seeing kind of the world bifurcated across from the South China Seas. Uh, to India, um, to uh, you know, to everyone having to pick their allies, but yet it's limited to two choices really. It's either us now or China, and we're not yeah. seeing as much. Just um, despite kind of the media rhetoric, because you know there's there's reasons for that, and uh, you know I describe it uh, sometimes when I see the propaganda as uh, the New York Times or WAPO or the Post, whatever it is, they're all you know the New York Post. They're all the same to me, right? Is <laughs> Uh, getting those paid inserts from uh, the Chinese Communist oh, yeah. Party is uh, a lot more profitable and a lot more guaranteed revenue than uh, su the subscriptions and sending out the daily newspapers. So I want to get in. So I think that China, its emergence is uh, not grabbing American share of the world, uh, which is growing. American share is growing, but actually grabbing the share of GDP and of growth from Europe um, mm -hmm. and from, you know, sadly, South America and some other places. So as those countries decline, um, they're, they're grabbing that GDP, they're grabbing that debt, they're building the nuclear power, you know, they're moving their industry in there. And, you know, we've seen that, for example, from Bolivia, where Brazil was their leading trading partner, and uh, now it's China and all of China is yeah. developing it. And so I'd like to get a better understanding of how you see this kind of affecting that bifurcation. You described it with the ports, so do continue with that just a little bit so I can understand the claving that's occurring. Well, you make a great point, Adam. In the bifurcation of the world, now it can't be a true bifurcation unless every nation in the world has to make a decision. It's not a you know slam dunk. They have to really look at both so options. It's, ad hoc, right? it's an ad hoc. It's an ad hoc thing. I mean, it's not the yeah. uh, or nothing, but there is an ad hoc and it's kind of like a 70-30 now, right? Yeah. So, I mean, they have to. I mean, it has to be. In other words, it's not true bifurcation if half the world doesn't even consider it even for a moment. It has to be something like that. So I'm going to blow your mind here with a couple of things. One is, okay. so, what's next? What's next now that this, these peace deals have been signed? So obviously, a lot of people are looking at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, which has had a, a growing cooperation with Israel on military and economic type uh, affairs for six years now, Will they, before the election maybe, because that's the big question, will they do the same thing the UAA and Bahrain did and, and, and sign a deal at the White House with Israel? And that would also be a message to China because a lot of the, the services and a lot of the things that they would get from China, Israel could take that place. And that would be choosing the United States through Israel, choosing the United States in that, in that two choice. And I'm going to really blow your mind. Okay. I read a Hebrew interview uh, two days ago with a Pakistani scholar who said, Pakistan may even be considering some kind of normalization or recognition of Israel. Can you believe it? Now, I can't, I can't, that. I can't, I can't in a way, and I'm gonna interrupt just for a second, but yeah. this is something that's so interesting to me because China, you know, people see America going through its social disruption. 
I don't think it's going through as much of an economic disruption as a transformation. I don't see us being compromised, but I see a transformation. I've discussed that a lot. But with you know Pakistan, where there's been the Belt and Road, and the Belt and Road uh, has been very ha- was always structurally vulnerable, and mm-hmm. the countries that were its clients were very GDP vulnerable. They were taking on a lot of debt to build these railroads, to build these coal mines, to build the airports, and to build the infrastructure that really was meant to service Chinese development for their own purposes, right? So the return on investment for those countries was very, very poor. Return on China, my cat wants to go outside, so you might hear. So the, <laughs> but the, the return for China was really fantastic. So uh, now we're seeing that kind of disrupted. And Pakistan yeah. is a good example of that. So, um, and without getting too much into the detail, I can definitely understand Pakistan, which was just put on, once again, the FATF gray list for its funding of terrorism, moving away from China and picking a side uh, that, uh, that can resolve some of their corruption in there, can resolve some of the Balakistan separatists. So I definitely can understand um, you know, Pakistan's moving towards Israel. So if you could actually, with my interruption, apologies, could you actually, could you actually continue that? Um, yes, I will. Listen, you're, you're a much better expert on that part of the world than I am, but you don't need to be a great genius to know that one of the major issues in India and Pakistan is water. Uh, and I think there's no doubt in my mind that for, for pound for pound and for all the technology, Israel's technology in purifying water and in increasing the potable and, and the drip irrigation type uh, supply of any given country makes it a very important country to get friendly with, whether you're India, Pakistan, some of the South American countries, or the state of California, right? I mean, desalination, they need it bad. So, you know, I look at my map and I see the Indus River going all the way through Pakistan and into, in, in, and into uh, in northern India, and I see that as a great way for, in, for Israel to sort of be friendly with both countries at the same time in a way no one's been able to do. They can basically say, look, we're going to work on your shared waterway of the Indus River and make it more cleaner, make it more potable, to teach you about drip irrigation. That's one of the ways. That's just one of the ways. So it was one of the reasons why I didn't think it was a 0% possibility that Pakistan would normalize relations with Israel. But I, I think it's a small chance that there'll be some continued cooperation. They've been cooperating on some intelligence issues because for all of Pakistan's issues with terrorism, sometimes they try to control it a little bit more. It's a tough thing to control. So I think it might expand to something beyond that. And so now, listen, Saudi Arabia needs it too. Now I'm going to move around the world, and some of it you've said, and I would just appreciate so much, and we've had so many people just join us, that uh, I would appreciate if we can kind of travel around the world again. So you discussed the United Arab Emirates, you discussed Bahrain, and you discussed the Sovereign Fund. And so would you mind giving a quick recap of that? Because I also want to get to a lot of the questions, because like I said, they're so much better than mine. Um, so uh, could, could we kind of do a recap of those countries and travel around the world a little bit? Yeah. And then once again, briefly discuss kind of that Nobel Prize and the significance of that uh, piece. Yeah, I mean, well, just in the last couple of weeks, you've gone from an announcement of just one country, the United Arab Emirates, obviously a very small place, Dubai being its its major center, saying that they're going to have a peace agreement, a normalization agreement with Israel, to Bahrain, a major Gulf state, even closer to Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates is, making a similar statement. Of course, we saw on Tuesday that, that signing ceremony at the White House. And by the way, all the speeches were short, which I think is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me watching this kind of thing. So that was great. So we saw those two countries do that. And then, of course, President Trump talking about it, and then the news media also starting to speculate about it, pundits speculating about it, whether Saudi Arabia, this huge big fish, the most important country in the Arab world right now, remember, used to be Egypt, but Saudi Arabia, because of its finances and because of its connection to the United States and its importance in the region, has become the most important Arab Muslim country. I know that, for example, Iran is not an Arab country, for those of you who are wondering about that. They're not Arabs, they're, they're Persian, it's a different it's a different kind of uh, ethnic makeup, even though they're also Muslim. So now there's the question, will Saudi Arabia do this as well? Uh, we were just a couple of weeks ago speculating on the long shot possibility that Donald Trump will be nominated by some credible source for the Nobel Peace Prize just for the UAE deal. Now, not only was he nominated, but we've had the Bahrain deal also come into it and then the Kosovo Serbia deal also announced. Now it looks like if there was any justice in this world, and there isn't a lot in the Nobel Peace Prize, it just hasn't happened enough, 
that Donald Trump would be kind of a shoe in for it because of the way that they've been able to expedite this. But now, of course, we're also the other thing that's going on right now is that we've been told there are other countries other than, other than the ones I just mentioned. And I would think Oman would be one of them. Uh, maybe even another smaller country is all, may also join into some kind of a deal. The question is, will this happen before Election Day? Because I happen to think that the Saudis really want Donald Trump to be reelected. And if they think if they can be convinced definitively that having a signing ceremony on the White House in October or something would help them get reelected, I think they would do it. We'll have to see if that's what they believe. So that's where we're going right now. But it's so important. You, you, know, you talked about going around the world. When the UAE and, the, and Bahrain made their little speeches before the peace deal, they made it clear, as I said earlier today, that they're not abandoning the Palestinians, but they've made it clear that what they're doing is not an abandonment. They're just saying to them, we're going to make this deal. We want you to join this prosperity bandwagon that we're creating. Let's do this. In other words, if we were really leaving you out or abandoning you, we would say, yeah, we wouldn't even mention you. But they both, everyone mentioned them. They all, everyone wants this problem solved. So in terms and, of the... In terms of, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry for interrupting, but I'm just so fascinated. I've got so many questions. Uh, and it's the same questions I would pepper with you and interrupt you, we'd be having a lunch, right? Is, uh, so in the language of diplomacy, uh, them mentioning pal uh, a Palestinian state uh, and including them, and you know, correct me on my terminology and, and, and such, uh, because I'm sure I'm wrong at some of these things. But then in diplomacy, in terms of them, saying saying that uh, is significant. Yeah, it's, it's very significant because the Palestinians are trying to, are, are very much have been against these deals. They, they're trying to couch it as, as a big loss for them. And I'm not the only one who's looked at this. Obviously, some of the Israeli politicians have said this. People who are just students of, of uh, a perception uh, and persuasion like Scott Adams have said this. What a loser position for the Palestinians to take. If your neighbors are all making a good deal, you have two choices. You can say, hey, I want a piece of that. Or you can say, I, this is a terrible thing that's happening. It shouldn't happen. Either, you know, if you choose option two, you're never going to get a good piece of that deal. Now, if you choose option one, it may be harder for you to get in on it at a later date and all of that. But it's likely that you're, you're going to have a much better chance. And you, know, you talk about going around the world. This also opens the door. If the Arab countries, which are literally related to the Palestinians by religion, for the most part, obviously there are Christian Palestinians, but most of them are Muslim. They're, they're related to them culturally and religiously. If they're willing to make more deals with Israel and more normalization with Israel, then shouldn't the Europeans, who for decades have been saying, well, we can't get too close to Israel because of the Palestinian issue, now they have an excuse. Forget about an excuse. They have a strong argument. They can say, look, we are doing the same thing that the UAE and Bahrain is doing. We're telling you Palestinians, we're not forgetting about you. We're not abandoning you, but we're going to create these new opportunities. And when you decide you want to get a, become a part of it, you can become a part of it. And that's so, what, for example, they tried to last summer with the, uh, with the, with the, um, the conference they had in Bahrain about what they could possibly, you know, the opportunities in the Middle East. So it's interesting that, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a stock person. So I always think of things in terms of financials, right? Just because mm -hmm. that's, that's like, that's my alma mater is finance in Wall Street. So in terms of um, kind of the PLA and, Pal and Palestinians and all the disruption there that's occurred for everybody, right? Is um, they've had a kind of self-reinforcing loop um, yeah. that's been very difficult to uh, kind of stop and at the same time, or even de-accelerate, right? And kind of slow it down. And it's been very difficult to introduce a lot of reality into that at some times, it appears to me. Uh, yeah. So do you feel that that can kind of interrupt and now um, we'll see kind of some equilibrium? Because we haven't seen that. It's been a state of continuous disequilibrium. Dis yeah. Well, let me tell you about the most important factor in all of this that I think is really been from the minds of the Arab countries, and that's time. You know, for years, the Palestinians and their supporters decided they were going to play the long game. At least 11 times since 1933, Palestinians have either been offered a state or a very clear path to a state. They've said no every time because they felt that if they played the long game, the day would come when they would be offered a state without having to live next door to a Jewish state. Figure, we can 
shift on this. Well, here's what's happened just in the last several years that has proved that strategy to be wrong for the other Arab countries who were supporting the Palestinians. One, Iran got a lot stronger. The Arab states pro correctly looked at the Iran nuclear deal and saw it for what it was, which was not something that was gonna slow Iran down, but something that would guarantee that Iran would get a nuclear weapon. Two, they saw that it was going to give Iran billions and billions of dollars that they would not use to improve anybody's economic situation. They would use for terrorism. They beefed up the civil war in Yemen with that money. They beefed up the situation in Syria with that money. They, they, it was just all used for mostly terrible things. So time ran out for a lot of the Arab countries who were supporting the Palestinians who for years were thinking, okay, we'll play the long game with you. We'll wait until there's that day where you get an opportunity for a state without having to share any territory with Jews or the Israelis. We'll wait for that. Well, now they found waiting doesn't work. You talk about the stock market and kind of how long are you going to wait to buy a really great IPO? Well, you, you got to move sometimes. Sometimes it's okay to wait, but sometimes you've got to move. And I think that Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and a number of the other countries that are going to be considering making deals like this have decided that you know what, the last six years, so much has happened, so much has changed, we can't wait anymore. And the Palestinian uh, people should think the same way. So uh, before, and I'm gonna ask you to repeat yourself just a little bit, uh, sure. is you were describing a sovereign wealth fund having yeah. now moved yeah. into Tel Aviv. So if you could repeat that, but then I also have questions about will the other sovereign wealth funds now that, are, that have to deploy capital, right? And yeah. they're looking for growth. They're looking for growth. They have to deploy capital. Uh, they understand the significance of deploying capital. And at the same time, there's now kind of a lot of intellectual transfers um, and uh, intellectual property transfers that are that are have to occur because that's what investments are, right? Yeah. Well, it, so yeah. I mean, to me, one of the biggest pieces of news that's that's occurred since the since the peace deal was announced, let alone signed on Tuesday was at the Abu Dhabi Investment Office, this is the official government-like investment fund, is opening its first ever foreign office. It's not just the first office in Israel, it's just their first ever foreign office, and it's in Tel Aviv. That's extremely telling. I think that has a lot to do with hoping to connect with all the American investors who come through Israel. You know, Israel punches way above its weight when it comes to startups, when it comes to any kind of investment opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they know that like, look, obviously foreign investors, American investors, even Jewish investors go to Dubai. I have friends who are in the diamond business. They have to go to Dubai. So it's not like they've never been there before. But when it comes to serious investment in things other than oil or things other than the local architect, you know, real estate there, Israel has a better platform for this. It's kind of like going to an investor conference and you have more than just an oil, an oil company or oil services company to sell or architecture, that kind of thing. So that's a very big development. Again, one of the you know real hard examples that we didn't get from the Israel-Egyptian peace deal. I promise you there was no Egyptian finance office that ever opened in Israel. I don't think there is one even now. So for that to happen within two weeks of the announcement, within two days of the peace deal, what a big deal that is. That's just, you cannot underscore, you can't under, you know, throw cold water on that. I would, I would hope that people would not do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you've been so helpful. And because we had a lot of people join us after you said it, I'm going to rehash some of it because I'm so fascinated by it. So I did not have, and I'm a 101 student. I'm so fascinated by this stuff, but I also know that I'm in the remedial class is uh, you would say that the reason it was um, kind of easy to be dismissive of or really not appreciate the significance of it is because there wasn't that visual moment where everyone just lays down their guns and everybody hugs and, uh, you know, they go away with, uh, a little bit of anger perhaps, well, probably a lot, but it's something that they also know that they're gonna work through emotionally and behaviorally and kind of within their own being. Um, and uh, also within their own kids being that it kind of will be something that continues. So there wasn't that moment. So, you know, what you're really describing is that, that same moment, but it's just not something that just makes for a good TV. So, you know, it's it's easy not to appreciate because it just is not a TV soundbite. Yeah. You know, we, we live in an age with a lot of photo ops and people say stuff and posturing. And we, we've had so much tangible. I mean, I, I really actually think that this is more important than the Israeli Egypt peace deal only because I think, for example, in 19, after the, the, the Yom Kippur War, which ended in 1973, 
I think Anwar Sadat and the leadership of Egypt decided there would be no more major shooting wars between Israel and Egypt. I think they decided that. So then they signed a deal, and it, I'm, not, I'm not saying it wasn't an important deal, but this to me is more important because already there's a tangible deal here. You know, somebody's daddy in Dubai is going to be going off to that Dubai office and coming home every once in a while, and, and, and that person's son or daughter is going to say, yeah, my dad's over in Israel, you know, at the office. <laughs> no one ever said that about anybody in Egypt. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's very valuable. Yeah. And again, it, to have public, when when Arab, when Arab cultural, when leaders in an Arab world do the same thing in private that they're doing in public, in this case is what's happening, they've had a private understanding with Israel for a little while on a number of things, but when they start doing it publicly and it doesn't contradict what they're saying privately, that is much more important you know, than, you, than, than you can say in a, in a Western culture. It's a cultural thing that's very, very important. So I'm gonna give you a two-part question, except one part is not related to the other. So uh, <laughs> what I wanna say while I remember it, so the first part is, is does that now give uh, Saudi Arabia, um, United Arab Emirates, as their income has been so you know, kind of contingent on you know, pumping out oil and oil prices, and uh, you know they've obviously been you know feeling a lot of pain through that, and I think Saudi Arabia just introduced a value-added tax for the first time, so uh, yeah. their people can't be too pleased about that. So does this also give them a lot of? Do they perceive this also as a, a chance to find a lot of growth and to kind of diversify their own investment portfolio? Very much so. You know, I was paying very close attention. I was live tweeting the the peace deal signing on Tuesday. And something that I noticed that both the UAE foreign minister and the Bahraini foreign minister both mentioned was the next generation. Now look, the UAE and Bahrain, these aren't like countries with huge populations. We're not talking, we weren't talking about like kids in the street or millions of children in a, in a, in a school room or something like that. They were talking about them. their in my, own language, they cross, in my language, finance, they kind of crossed a challenge. They crossed that chasm. It's like an innovator's dilemma and they kind of made it over. So there yeah. is kind of once somebody leaps, you know, it's uh, and says that, the, yeah. you know, and makes it successfully across the chasm, it does bring good things. Yeah, well, they were talking about, Adam, they were talking about their own children, the elite, the elite in Bahrain and UAE. You know what, there's not that many, uh, they can't all be in the oil business. They're kind of running out of positions there. I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia has like hundreds and hundreds of princes similar to the UAE and Bahrain. Oh, yeah. They need diversification. They need their children, literally their children. They were talking about their own children, I promise you. They were saying they want their children to be able to get in on technology. They're, listen, they follow markets. They know the technology is the growth area. Maybe they want to be part of Space Force. By the way, the UAE foreign minister in his speech found a way to mention the fact that there was a, a, a citizen of the UAE who had flown to the International Space Station. I hope you caught that. No, I that did. I'm so, glad you said I'm so enthusiastic of Space Force, and I'm yeah. really curious about who's going to be taking us up because we're going to be in cislunar orbit very soon. People just have no appreciation for how quick these things happen, and uh, we're going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of people living in cislunar orbit, living on the moon, yeah. um, and uh, I'm really excited about who's going to take me up there. Right? Who's yeah. going to be my pilot? And who's going to be serving me the? I don't drink cocktails, but who's going to be serving me the drinks? Because there's going to be a lot of hospitality out there, also. Yeah. And uh, you know, the first flights are you know very expensive, but uh, you know the first TVs were expensive, and the first color TVs, and you know my parents couldn't afford it, but uh, we got the black and white. And then as I grew up, I could buy a couple of color TVs. So, yeah, I've got another so, question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You go. No. So my point is they know that they have to diversify. You know, we've talked about it just from an economic standpoint, they can't just be on oil, but it's for their own kids. Literally the kids of, the, of those top officials who were there that day, you'd think, oh, they just get them some cushy job in, in the oil companies. They can't do that. There's, there's not enough room for it. And even if there were, it's not the future. They want their kids to have it. So I think that they're envisioning a day where maybe they could go to an Israeli university, where maybe they could team with one of their VC um, you know, programs. That's what they were. That's what this is about. And again, one of the reasons why this is a real thing. Gotcha. So uh, we're about to go into a speed round, and I'm going to introduce a speed round. Well, everyone's been so top. Everyone's been so kind to us, and it's you know, I, and I just so much appreciate, and I so much appreciate your time as well. And uh, we're trying to be good guests on everybody's Twitter feed, right? So uh, it's going to be a speed round. But I'm going to ask the first question, and then I see so many other good ones. Is uh, you know, the announce the the. Uh, the expectation that's been set out for several years, maybe even 20 years, I don't know, or maybe you know longer, is that 
uh, if ever there was something that presented itself as a uh, peace, right? Whether it, there was there was an impermanence to it or whether it was something that was kind of fixed, um, is that there would be a, a lot of uh, social uh, upheaval um, throughout uh, because the resentments and the anger, and you know these reasons better than I do, so I don't know, but there, that there would be riots and protest. And uh, there hasn't been that visual moment either, right? That's right. Hey, you know, you, you hear that? That's the dog that isn't barking. Where's the massive protests across the Middle East? Where are, yeah. the, where are the fires? Where are the riots? Sadly, I, we've had more riots in Portland and Seattle in the last month than we've had in the Middle yeah. East. But it's clear to me that the so-called yeah. Arab street, I'm not saying they're going to love the Israeli people or love the Jewish yeah. culture, but clearly this isn't something that's enraging them in any way. I, yeah. it, it's really something we, we should all notice. All right, so we're going to go into the speed round, right? And uh, it's 45 minutes now, so we'll, we're going to try and wrap up it exactly uh, after one hour. So uh, we'll go from speedy to speedier to speediest. So first, I want to thank Guy Mishmish -Mish for being here. Thank you so much. And I see Mustang Girl is here, and uh, she's such a wonderful person, and we have a, a relationship within DM as well, and she's just been so so wonderful to me. And I see the emissary here as well. So um, our – so – Bart de Graff, and thank you for being here, ask, how do the uh, how do the peace deals affect Israeli politics? Well, you know, Israeli politics right now, in, if you can believe it, is really even more polarized than the United States right now. You've had a situation in the U.S. where there's been, you know, there's a party that's just kind of sort of being the anti-Trump party. I don't know if there's a lot of, like, real strength in friendship. Sorry about this. No. Uh, in friendship with, um, I think it's really... It is, we have a party right now that's really just trying to run a candidate or something the anti-Trump party. There's been a lot of that in Israel, an anti-Netanyahu party. Um, I think it will have a small effect, believe it or not. It's so polarized that it's not going to like suddenly make Netanyahu that much more popular. But I do think it will have a delaying effect on the push for new elections. Israel's had too many elections. They've had three elections in the course of just like the last year or so. It's been a very, very difficult situation for them. So I think this will delay any quick march to a next election. I wish it would have a more positive effect than that, but for now, that's it. I got a follow-up question to that, right? And thank you so much for asking about the graph, and that allows me to ask a follow-up to it. So in Israel, is there also kind of a media muting to what's going on within their own media? No, no um, but there is, a, there, there is a strong portion of the Israeli news media that's trying to down to, to sort of talk it down. So they're not, they're not suppressing the story. That would, be, that would be futile. In the United States, you can get away with that. The Israeli media can't get away with suppressing a story like this. But some of the, you know, the, the left-wing media in Israel is also the dominant power in the media there. And I don't want to be part of the political, it's, it's, I'm just saying this, this is a fact. There's no one who would deny that. So they're trying to talk really strongly against it. But the two, the, the, the biggest newspaper in Israel, actually with the biggest circulation, is actually very pro Netanyahu, so they're playing it up. And the yeah. Jerusalem Post, which is the, the most English language friendly, it's, you know, they have a Hebrew edition, but there's an English edition that's really very dominant for the rest of the world. They're, they're covering this very positively. They're seeing it as a very good thing. So no, it's not being suppressed in Israel in any way. It's just that you have a certain segment of the news media there that's trying to, Gotcha. I wouldn't say downplay it. They're not downplaying it. They're just trying to say, hey, what did this guy who gave up for this deal? They're trying to make it sound like he gave up too much. That's been the narrative. Speed round. Speed round. We're now up to the speedier, right? So Pastor Derek Teeson, thank you so much for being here, says uh, he cut the red tape. And uh, could you help me better understand that? Yeah. Well, this has been Netanyahu's MO the whole time. Like I said, when he was finance minister, he did. He, he slaughtered the sacred cows of pensions and also the regulations on pharma. There could have been a lot of things here where he could have slowed things down and said, well, we want to wait and see on a number of things we got to get. He, Netanyahu really pushed and, and allowed for the Trump administration to speed this, uh, this agreement up. Even then, it took a while. It wasn't like it happened overnight. Gotcha. But yeah, he wasn't going to wait for anything more. Okay. That was good. You got that speedy around down good. So thank you very much. So uh, David, thank you so much for being here. Um, who says, I wanted to be careful not to generalize, but the deal seems to be economic pragmatic at its core. David, that's what's good about it. Pragmatic economic deals are much more valuable than the photo op, hey, we love each other kind of thing, which, which for example, in Egypt, went right back to teaching their kids horrible things about the Jews in Israel. This is so much more important. 
uh, people who are downgrading it because they, I, I'm going to agree and amplify. You're right. It was economic at its core, and that's why it's so good. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we have another question. And I want to remind you just uh, with your mic and with your own uh, you know, wonderful uh, New Yorker speed, uh, which I have also, but I, uh, I turned myself down to an 80 speed, is uh, yeah. so uh, Guy Mish Mish. And I remember, uh, thank, and I remember, I have a good memory, that uh, when Guy Mish Mish was here uh, last, they made the same comment. So I'm very interested um, in, you know, how that now continues because this is significant um, and there are, you know, real, uh, real estate, um, um, uh, you know, consequences on the good side of it. So can you uh, comment on that? Yeah, well, it's further proof of why you have to tune into these Adam Towns scopes, listen to Tino back in Adam Towns, because we were talking about how the Tel Aviv real estate demand and market has been so strong, so much so that it's spilled out to the neighboring city. Uh, Tel Aviv's neighboring city is the ancient city of Jericho, which is mostly an Arab city, although there are Jews that live there. There were some dead parts of Jericho that bordered right on Tel Aviv. You can walk between the two of them, almost everyone does. But that's become a real bustling area. I predict, especially because there's going to be more Arabs now going into Tel Aviv to maybe be part of that Abu Dhabi investment office, they're going to want to live in some of these Cease port side front properties that are being built in in Jaffa or Yafo in Hebrew or in Arabic is what it's called. Very historic place, by the way. That's where Jonah went on his trip before he gets swallowed by the whale, right? So it's it's a really lovely place to go. There is no doubt that what's going to happen, like happens in every real estate boom, it means that there's a spilling out of the central hot area. You can't just everyone can't buy the, the same so building, right? So you spill it out. I'm going to continue with that question because it's so interesting. And uh, before I remember your response was also very favorable and now it's even more favorable. So it's really interesting to see. So now do you see kind of um, the elite money migrating there also because of the liquidity of the investment? So in New York, we've seen this huge price appreciation in Austin and in some other markets just because of the liquidity of the market where they know that, uh, you know, it's like buying a, a Van Gogh or a, a Da Vinci, you know that it's always got that you've always got some liquidity on that investment, unlike you know in San yeah. Francisco or LA or in, you know other parts of the world where there's a lot of uh, volatility. Look, the entire state of Israel is only the size of New Jersey, and a good part of it is inhabitable. So you already have the location, location, location equation going in your favor in a situation like the country's population is still growing, and the economy has been you know, obviously it's been hurt by Corona, but it's still in a pretty good shape compared to its neighbors. I can't possibly see uh, a lot of real estate developers and, and, and I think tech companies are gonna start thinking, well now if the major Gulf countries of all of their investment power start coming in there, maybe we should think about putting more of our uh, locations and more of our people in that part of the world because we're already doing a lot of deals with Israel yeah. or, and hoping to get clients anyway. So I'm gonna I, get I think a bell. it's absolutely gonna grow. Cool, I'm gonna get like a bell, right? Uh, yeah, no problem. These speedier rounds are kind of hard, and now we're up to the speediest yeah. round. Uh, and I also want to say hello to some people who have been so thoughtful to join us. So uh, Generator 16, uh, and uh, again, I said it yesterday, is, uh, you know, uh, I, I appreciate so much. And thankfully, they introduced themselves off, you know, the, uh, the Twitter platform where we had a chance to kind of uh, – to share each other's background and, and they shared theirs with me and I'm just uh, so thankful of it. So thank you again. So um, they ask if Trump is reelected, is Iranian regime change a near certainty? Will China prop up Iran and others? No, it's not a near certainty, but what they will do if Trump is reelected is try to reassess, see if they can change their message just a little bit to delay a little bit more. And yeah, they would probably try to lean on China a little bit to give them more time. I. It's more likely than not that you know that Trump isn't reelected, but I don't think it's something that would happen overnight. No. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And um, I'm going to go back to another David question because it's just so interesting. So David asked, Kushner gets a lot of public credit. What did he bring to the table that was unique, if anything? He didn't bring any baggage. I mean, have you seen this video of John Kerry going around the internet now, basically act, acting as the mouthpiece for? decades and decades of official Washington State Department failure. I mean, you can see if you've been a State Department diplomat your whole career and you start looking at a deal like this, which you said was not possible until there was a deal with the Palestinians, it kind of means you have to buck 
everything that you've been taught and everything you work for for a lot of decades. Guess what? Jared Kushner didn't ever work for the government or never worked for the State Department. So his lack of baggage is the reason why he was such an important part of this deal. So absolutely, yes. Okay, so adorable, and thank you for that. Adorable, deplora. I just want to throw that comment on there. They say, hey guys, sorry I'm late, but I'm glad to be able to be here live. And I'm so thankful that you are here live because I really enjoy kind of regaining the intimacy of these. So uh, I think that's really wonderful. So thank you for being here as well. So um, the Alex Minot, Minasa, I hope I said that right. I've got a little bit of a lisp. So uh, I have difficulty even saying my own name with that S. So uh, Israelite, uh, Israelites and Arabs both respond to higher religious authorities. How can this be leveraged? Um, they said F peace, but how can this be uh, leveraged for peace? Uh, the $64 billion question. Don't, really? you know, don't Muslims and Jews have, you know, aren't they ever at war with each other? Don't they have a deep seated hatred for each other? How can they possibly make peace? Well, I ask you to study your history. For most of the religious life of Islam, which started in whatever, I guess the seventh century, right? And, and in, Ju in Judaism, there hasn't been any open conflict. In fact, if you were a Jew living in the world up until the 19th century, it was better to live in an Arab country, in a Muslim country, than it was in a Christian country. My point is there's absolutely nothing in Islam. There's a difference between Islam and Islamism and Jewish extremism. There's not enough of them to fill a phone booth. The fact is, I'm not saying it's kumbaya lovey-dovey, but if you really know your history, you know the coexistence between Jews and Arabs, especially Jews and Muslims, is more than possible. It's been the norm up until the last 90 years. And all we need to do is go back to that. It's not that hard. These deals prove that we're ready to do that. Okay, and uh, LWC8, um, and thank you for being here, makes a comment. And I don't uh, know that language, and I know a few languages, and I just hope that they're very kind. So uh, if, uh, if you would care to translate, that would be fantastic. So um, I wanna continue, and I wanna say hello to Malcolm, and uh, I, I so much appreciate Malcolm. Malcolm is great. You know, I talk about investments a lot and how I think it's important that people invest. And uh, I probably don't quantify and qualify that enough because investments uh, uh, express themselves, you know, thinking, contemplating the future and that kind of internal, um, you know, discourse that has to occur for somebody to be optimist and kind of plan forward uh, happens in so many different ways. And one of them, is uh, how delighted I am when I see a, a young person, you know, reading the classics, or a young person, even the classics, Napoleon Hill, and thinking grow rich, because for many people that's uh, that's uh, better than college, um, because they they have this self awareness that that book really brings. So uh, Malcolm, I uh, Malcolm is awesome. So uh, Malcolm is going to do good things. He's making real investments in himself, and uh, and that shows. So I also want to say hello to uh, milk them. And uh, what? And uh, she has such a wonderful name. And thank you so much for being here because it's Milt M. And I think that that's just so awesome. I just love the name. I'd love to know a little bit more of the uh, history of it. So um, I want to just conclude with just a couple of questions. Um, and um, this um, crazy news cycle. Um, and I don't want to get too much lost in you know the politics of certain things because. Politicians kind of come and go no matter what, particularly in America, where a lot of countries can just kind of wait for the cycles, right? They, you know, they're predictable every four years. So um, I'm going to extend their question a little bit by saying, is this something that, in, that now endures um, Trump or, you know, whoever comes next and whoever comes after them and whoever comes after them? So crazy news cycle. Thank you so much for being here. Asks uh, by uh, and observes. By Trump opening up American oil, he pressured oil countries to get on board. Yeah, I mean, the fact that the, the, the urgency, the sense of urgency that the oil producing Arab countries had when it came to the, the fact that the United States is becoming self-sufficient in oil, and they're, you know, we've been the biggest consumer for so long, that played a huge role, absolutely. It, it played a role in speeding it up, and I think it will last post-Trump or post this administration oh. because, again, the financial opportunities that come beyond oil. And uh, that's going to be a question that I see a little bit down here. So uh, the emissary, thank you so much for being here, says, do you see any future normalization between Iran, Israel, perhaps after uh, their theocracy is toppled? Well, Which, and they, they seem to be uh, kind of an aging out regime. Yeah. Look, I, I think, you know, don't get me wrong. In one of my previous answers, I made it sound like, you know, there wouldn't be any change. I, I do think we're closer to it than we have before. The regime in Iran right now has never been weaker 
since not since it took over in 1979. There's no doubt about it. Question, and and I think that the answer is yes because what have we heard at the last two major protest movements that broke out in Iran, both in 2019 and then earlier than that, I guess in 2017, is we don't want any more foreign money going to Palestine. We're, we're sick of all the terrorism that you're sponsoring, and that's basically saying stop attacking Israel, which means okay. we can talk with these people. So, Eric, thank you so much for being here. Eric asked, what precisely was the U.S. Trump's role in facilitating peace beyond hosting the talks? Oh, well, I think there was a, a big push in under, telling the Saudi, in, in this case, the UAE and Bahrain, that anything that they wanted to ask for when it came to the United, U.S. aid or even something that they would act, demand of Israel, the U, that the U.S. wouldn't uh, stand on ceremony and say, oh, no, you can't say that. You can't do this. I think that they also were basically telling them that whatever needs to be done to make a, for the banking connections between Israel and UAE, which have been going on, would be facilitated by the Fed and other and other international banking authorities. Sort of have a little bit of influence on a lot of influence. So I think they basically said, like, we're going to make sure that your checks are cashed on time, that that the that the, that the, the letters are stamped. There's not going to be any kind of slow walking in the State Department, which was a real threat because the State Department doesn't want doesn't didn't want this progress. Interesting. And I'm, I know we're running a little bit over now, but why do you feel, the st and I, there's some other questions, so we're going to get speediest, whatever's faster than speediest, we're going to be there in a moment. So uh, Dagny Dream says, yes, just look at Iran. Many Jews live there. Well, not as many as there used to be, obviously. But yes, there are Jews who still live in Iran, and they've been able to make a life for themselves in some way. They're in a very perilous situation. But absolutely, I mean... <laughs> The Jews lived very well in, in, in Persia and then Iran for many, many generations. There is no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think for a second that it's not possible to reestablish some kind of friendly relationship, even if it isn't completely like a cultural exchange. It can be very similar to what's going on now with the UAE and Bahrain. There's, there's no reason why it can't happen. You've just got to get a gen, you have a genocidal regime in power, which doesn't really want to do good things even for its own people. When they're gone, let's talk. Okay, and, the, and thank you for that. And the Dean95, thank you so much for being here, let, says, let's say we achieve peace in the Middle East. Where does that leave us, America? And I'm, again, going to extend that a little bit because I'm so curious myself about these things. Is is this something that we'll be able to see um, can improvement on and economically and kind of the visuals of it? And, you know, what's what's how are we going to, uh, you know, um, see this in our own lives? Well, this is a very important point because – in an interview he did just before the peace agreements, Jared Kushner did something really, really smart. He spoke briefly about this friendship between Israel and these other countries, but he immediately brought it back home. And he said, now, you know, all that money we've been spending on wars and, and the boy and, and, and lives lost, and now we can focus more on our domestic spending. Boy, that was really, really a great answer. I was actually thinking what a missed opportunity it was that President Trump didn't say the same exact words in his, in his speech. It was a nice brief speech. I think he wanted to go quickly. In the future, especially on the campaign trail, I would advise him to say the same thing. So that's the first answer. But the second answer is a little bit about what we were talking about before. America's biggest rival in the world right now is China, and another troublemaker the U.S. has to deal with is Russia. If there is peace in the Middle East, both China and Russia are losers in a big way because they profit from that mayhem. They profit from the chaos. If there's less chaos in the Middle East, they don't have as much to sell those countries and the rest of the world. It's a big plus for the United States on the foreign stage and the domestic stage. Okay, and now I'm so delighted to see Tracy here. And uh, Tracy is uh, truly an expert in um, fossil fuels and kind of the geopolitics of it, which is you know obviously extremely considerable and something, again, I'm always in uh, the 101 class, the remedial class. I can't get myself out because there's just so much happening. It's so dynamic. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. And um, she makes uh, two things. I'm going to show both of her uh, comments. Uh, the first, uh, Chigurh ask, deal with United Arab Emirates also allows for Israel to play a much bigger role in the region's energy trade. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for years, that's been the dream that Israeli stock market, Israel's stock market and Israel's fi financial tech, fintech, would find a more exotic way for hedging to go on. You know, oil is a really volatile commodity if you haven't noticed. And the the, the really the, those really smart fine fintech guys and gals who do things to make sure that companies and countries and businesses that rely on a little bit more of a stable oil price 
All that kind of hedging and things like that is, I, I, I have no doubt that Israel's FinTech will make that more possible. That's always been what I've, I've been dreaming of that for 25, 30 years. So now we're gonna continue with our part two of that. And uh, thank you again. Um, Israel is rich in natural gas, lots of opportunity in the energy sector. Um, yeah. So that, that's, I'm sorry. Well, that's already, by the way, that was, you know, I'm so glad you asked that too. She asked that too, because that was part of the building blocks of this deal as well. When Israel had that huge discovery called the Leviathan natural gas uh, deposits in their, in the waters in the Northern part of Israel, they already started to make some deals. Israel has been supplying natural gas to some of its traditional enemies now for a little while, Egypt and, 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 and some of the countries that were kind of cold to Israel, like Cyprus and Greece. You know, this is a pretty big deal. That I think played a role in these deals as well because people saw this can happen. Okay, and one of the things, and we're gonna close in just one minute, so thank you everybody for joining us, is uh, one of the things I really enjoy about Twitter uh, and Periscope is again, regaining that intimacy. And I try and think of these as kind of the, uh, the breakfast, lunch, and dinners with friends that we've all lost in our lives. So uh, I'm just happy that it's, it's a part of us, uh, if even with some distance. So uh, the, here's the exchange. So Pastor Derek uh, says uh, to Chigal, also embracing Gen 4 nuclear. And yeah. Uh, yeah, listen, I'm a huge proponent of the advanced uh, opportunities we have in nuclear power in this country. I mean, you look at what's going on in California and other parts of the country, we desperately need nuclear power. This is something that most Americans don't know. Nuclear power is a lot safer than it was. Nuclear waste is a lot more manageable than it was. Israel would benefit greatly from this, and so would the wider Middle East, especially if we can feel confident it's not connected to a, wep a weapons program. And okay. there's, there are ways to do that. I, I'm, I'm, hope I'm hopeful that goes in that direction as well. Yeah, and, uh, and Chigil's reply, because that was something that was between them, and I just wanted to share it because I thought it was so awesome. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And then so Tracy uh, replies to um, Derek, to Pastor Derek, and she says yes. So uh, I think that's, that's awesome. And um, I want to thank everybody for being here. And Jake, I called you up on such a short notice and said, let's do this because I, you know, I was uh, in the advanced classes and I realized I didn't belong there and I wanted to go back to the 101s to learn all this stuff. So thank you very much for being so kind and generous with your time. Always my great pleasure. This is one of my favorite topics. It's just, it's, it's not even a, it's just an Israel story. It's a story of human achievement we can get the, if, if, if that kind of part of the world can get somewhere like they really truly have in the last, you know, it, it's such a great, it, it says a lot about where we can go everywhere else. Great. And uh, I also want, and thank you for that. And I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us. And again, uh, hopefully we were a uh, good guest. And uh, we also are the guests that uh, no one has time to get up and leave and, and to thank the host. So uh, thank you everybody for being here and uh, have a wonderful day. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye bye.